الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين استفاء خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في آخر سورة التغاب أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم واسمعوا وأطيعوا وأنفقوا خيرا لأنفسكم ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون إن تقرضوا الله قرضا حسنا يضاعف لكم ويغفر لكم والله شكور حليم عالم الغيب والشهادة العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا ألهمنا رشدنا وعزنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه آمین یا رب العالمین We were discussing سمع و طاعة which appeared in آیا نمبر 16 of سورة التغابن and we were discussing to whom this سمع و طاعة for whom this سمع و طاعة this listening and obeying for whom I told you essentially, basically, philosophically, the obedience is for Allah only, none else. But practically, it is for the messenger of Allah. Let me give you a few ayat and a hadith from the Prophet Surah Al-Nisa, آیت سکسٹی فور وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ We never sent any messenger but that he should be obeyed with the permission of Allah سبحانه وتعالى The obedience to messenger is with the permission of Allah سبحانه وتعالى So actually the obedience is for Allah سبحانه وتعالى Then we have eight times in one surah, surah to shu'ara. All the messengers of Allah ask their nations, their people, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاتِعُونَ Have taqwa for Allah. We have discussed فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Have regard for Allah, have taqwa for Allah. Be God conscious. And obey me. So practically the obedience is for the messenger. Then we have another ayah in Surah Al-Nisa, ayah 65. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ الْوَعْلَىٰ يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Nay. By your Lord, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam By your Lord, nay, they can never be mu'min. لَا يُمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Until they accept you as the final decision giver, final authority. In all matters which arise among them, any dispute, any problem, unless they accept you as the final authority, they are not Mormons. Summa la yajadu dufi and fosim harajam mimma kawaita. And then they shouldn't find within their hearts any ill feeling towards what you have, what the judgment you have given. Even if they accept, but there is some ill feeling within their hearts, even then there is negation of Iman, they have no Iman. 
there should be no negative feeling about the judgment that you have given. If they are mu'min, they have to accept it wholeheartedly, from the depths of their hearts. If somebody finds regarding some opinion of the Prophet that my heart is not accepting it, it's a red signal that you are falling short of Iman. According to this, the verdict of this ayah of Surah An-Nisa. Then the hadith, the Prophet once said, very beautiful words, Kullu ummati yadkhulun al-jannah illa man abah. And this is from the study of Imam Bukhari. And the companion of the Prophet who reported is Abi Huraira, Razi Allah Ta'ala. Kullu ummati yadkhulun al-jannah illa man abah. All of my ummah, every individual of my ummah will enter Jannah. Except those who, him, who, who him, themselves refuse. Kullu ummati yadkhulun al-jannah illa man abah. All my ummatis, each one of my ummah will enter Jannah. Except those who themselves refuse to enter. Now he was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who will refuse? We can't understand. It's unintelligible for us. Who will refuse to enter the Jannah? And then the Prophet said, Man atani dakhal al-Jannah wa man asani faqad aba. Whosoever obeys me, he will enter the Jannah. And whosoever disobeys me, it is as if he has refused to enter Jannah. That was the way of the teaching of the Prophet You know, the first sentence was very interesting. Who will refuse to enter Jannah? Kala man atani dakhal al-Jannah wa man asani Whosoever disobeys me, he is refusing to enter Jannah. So actually, the obedience is essentially for Allah, practically for his messenger. Now about the messenger of Allah, a few points must be very clear. The messenger of Allah had many positions at the same time. Number one, he was conveying the message of Allah. That was the primary function of his being the messenger of Allah. Then number two, he was the head of the community. When there was a state, he was the head of the state. Number three, he was the commander-in-chief. Who was the commander-in-chief at Badr or at Uhud? or at Azab, or at Hunayn, himself. Number four, he was the Chief Justice, Qazi al So actually, these are the various positions that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held simultaneously. Now we must analyze these positions. As messenger of Allah also, he was getting the guidance from Allah in two ways. Number one, which we call in Arabic, al wahyul jali the verbal revelation, which was coming through angel Jibreel. It is Quran. Number two, the inspiration, the wahiya khafi. That was also wahi. It was coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is not, not verbal. It, could, it came directly to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, through dreams, he saw that we are performing Umrah. And that became the basis of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. 
because even the dreams of the prophets are wahi. You know, Hazrat Ibrahim he saw in dream that he was sacrificing Ismail. Ya Bunaya inni arafil maname anni asbahu ka fandur magatara. It was not an express verbal revelation for Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. It was a dream. He saw in the dream. But all the dreams of the prophets are wahi. They are from Allah. So you must understand, there are certain people you know who think that only Quran is the wahi. No, Quran is verbal revelation. There were extra revelations, extra wahi to the Prophet ﷺ through dreams, through inspiration. Because Prophet ﷺ gave many orders on the basis of that inspiration that he was getting continuously from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let me quote here, you know, because this has become a very controversial issue these days. There are people who say we believe in Quran and that's all. We don't want, we don't need hadith, we don't need sunnah. The function of the Prophet was only to convey the word of Allah to humanity. That word of Allah is there with us in the form of Quran. There's no need of hadith, there's no need of sunnah. This has become a universal, you know, misguidedness, a very big mistake because people want to follow the West in their attitudes, in their lifestyle. And you know the Sunnah of the Prophet, the Hadith that comes in the way, they want to do away with it. That's a big fitna of our time, in Kare Hadith. Refuse to accept Sunnah or Hadith. So there's a hadith which has been reported by Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Darmi, Rahimahumullah, three muhaddisin. And the reporter, the companion of the Prophet who reported is Miqdam ibn Ma'di Karb, Razi Allah ta'ala an. The Prophet said, Ala inni utitu al-Qur'ana wa mislahu ma'ahu. Beware. I have been given Quran and another thing which is like it in addition to it. Allah inni uti tul Quran wa mislahu maahu. Allah yushiku rajulun shabanu. Allah arikate hi yakul alaykum bihad al Quran. I fear there will be some person sitting on his couch and he will say. Follow only this Quran. Fama wajatu fihe min halal in fa'illu. Whatever you find in it is permissible halal, you also take it as halal. Fama wajatu fihe min haram in far remove. And whatever you find in Quran that it is haram, take it to be haram. Wa innama harrama Rasulullah kama harram Allah. Take it from me that the Messenger of Allah has also declared haram something just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared haram. Additional, the very simple example is that Quran says that you cannot have two sisters in marriage simultaneously. There is polygamy in Islam, it's allowed. You can have four wives at a time, but not two sisters. And the Prophet said, the same hurma will be for an aunt and the niece. And what should you call, you know, khala and bhanji. A, a woman and the sister of her mother, they can't be in the nikah, in marriage of one person simultaneously. And a woman and the sister of her father, they cannot be in marriage of one person simultaneously. Just as two sisters cannot be, but Quran declares only about two sisters. The Prophet has added two more relations. So actually, but this is due to inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So there is something more which was given to the Prophet than Quran. Allah in the Uti to Quran of a Misnu Ba'af. Then there's another hadith. It hasn't also been reported by Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Ibn Majah, Imam Bayhaqi, Rahimahumullah, and Abi Rafa'in, Radiyallahu ta'ala an. Laul fayanna ahadukum ala arikatihi yatih al-amru min amri, mimma amartu bihi. Aur nahaytu anhu, fayakul la adri ma wajadna fi kitab illahi tabana. Beware of a person sitting on his couch and he will say about something that I have declared to be haram or halal. He will say, wait, we, we don't find these things in the Quran. We shall follow only Quran and nothing else. So the Prophet warned of this fitna beforehand. A time will come when people will say, we accept Quran only, no sunnah of the Prophet, no hadith of the Prophet. Nothing of this sort. This is a big fitna. So when Muhammad ﷺ was behaving as a messenger, he had two things to convey, the wahi a jali the evident wahi the verbal revelation that is Qur'an, and the wahi a khafi the hidden revelation that is the inspiration. Now the third thing was his own personal judgments. After all, he was a human being. When matters confronted him, there were problems. He made his judgments. Regarding these personal judgments, the practice of the Sahaba was they used to ask the Prophet whether this thing that you are saying is from Allah or from your own self, your own mind, your own thinking. And if it is from your own thinking, are we permitted to express some difference of view, some different opinion? And the Prophet used to say, yes, come forward. And at many times, he accepted the opinion of the followers. He cancelled his own decision. This must be remembered. As a person, he was Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He was just like a man who can have a wrong judgment. But if the judgment was regarding halal or haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to correct him. And if there is no correction coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does it mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has confirmed his judgment, then it becomes a part of the sharia. But if the matter doesn't concern halal and haram, sharia. It's a matter of expediency, a timely affair, or some scientific phenomenon, then you know, we can leave his opinions. This is very important. Again, you know, you need a balance. Now, let me give you an example. In Badr, on the occasion of the Battle of Badr, the Prophet said, well, fix your tents here at this place. Now the Sahaba came. Oh, Messenger of Allah, if this decision is through Wahi, okay, Samayna wa ta'ala. If it is your personal judgment, do you allow us to express our opinion? He said, yes. Because he had no experience of wars or battles. He was going to war or battle for the first time in his life. Now the Sahaba said, in our opinion, on the basis of our, our experience, we think that that place is better for our camp. And instantaneously the Prophet said, okay, uproot these tents from here, fix them there. Very important thing. It was not of Sharia, it was not of Halal or Haram. It was an administrative, a managerial type of thing, a timely affair, a timely matter. It doesn't concern any Wahi. 
He accepted. Secondly, at Ohod, his personal opinion was that we should, we should defend Medina entrenched from the walls of Medina. We shouldn't go out in the open field. But many, the, many of the Sahaba, they said, no, we should go and fight them in the open field. There were many who, didn't, who couldn't go to Badr. There were many who had embraced Islam after Badr. Now they had, you know, we want Shahada. We want to lay down our lives for the cause of Allah, for His pleasure. Why should we stay in Medina and defend within the walls of Medina? And Prophet decided against his personal opinion in favor of the opinion of the Sahaba. Let me give you another example. There was a maid, slave maid of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was Barira. And she had married as a slave to a slave. He was Bughis radiallahu ta'ala A slave married to a slave with the permission of the masters. Now Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha set her that maid slave free. When she became free, now she had a choice whether she wants to continue as wife of Bughis or if she wanted, you know, because now she was free and Bughis was a slave. She had a higher level. So she decided that she will not continue in marriage with Bughis. And Bughis was in deep love with her. Razi Allah ta'ala anhuma. He requested, requested. She refused. Then he went to the Prophet wasallam. Please, O Messenger of Allah, I love her. You recommend to her that she, she should continue with me. The Prophet called Hazrat Barira. Barira, why don't you continue in marriage with Bughis? She asked a question. Just imagine how deep legal sense a slave girl had. O oh, Messenger of Allah, is it your order or only a recommendation? The reply was, no, 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 no order, just a recommendation. I can't accept your recommendation. He rejected the recommendation of the Prophet You must keep these things. There should be a balance. And the most important, you know, event is coming now. It pertains to scientific phenomena. The Ansar of Medina, they were cultivators, farmers, gardeners. They used to arrange artificial pollination. Not artificial, they used to bring together the male flowers and the female flowers of date. Date, you know, this plant has male flowers separately, female flowers separately. Now, if you close, take them close, then pollination, possibility of pollination would be more. If they are widely apart, well, nature does arrange through air or something else. But you know, if the, the, the flowers, male and female flowers, are near to each other, there are more chances of pollination. The Prophet said he had no experience of any agriculture. He lived all his life in Makkah, Wadi Ghair Zizar. It had nothing, nothing growing in Makkah. No gardens, no, no, you know, harvest, no farming, nothing of the sort. He was a businessman. He knew all the ins and outs of business, but not of agriculture. He said to the Ansar, what if you don't do it? Why do you do it? Why don't you let, leave it to the nature? And even these words were, sought, so to say, order for them. They didn't do it. The Prophet is saying, don't do it. What's the need? The result was that that year, you know, the fruit was less. 
less pollination, less fruit. Now they came and hesitantly they said, Oh, Masjid Rafullah, you, you, we used to do that thing. And because you said, why, why you do it? We didn't do it this time. The result is that you know this, this time we have less fruit. Now, please note the words. Please note the words. Faqala, and this is included in the study of Imam Muslim. An Rafi ibn Khalid radiallahu ta'ala an. Faqala innama ana basha. Iza abartukum bishayim min amru dinekum fa khuzubihi. Wa iza abartukum bishayim min rayi fa innama ana basha. I'm also a man like you, a human. If I tell you something about your deen, take it. It is from Allah. It's the wahi. Either wahi a jali or wahi a khafi. Either it is Quran, it is apparent, evident, or it is inspiration that I'm getting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There you have to add wahi a khafi to it. But if I say something to you about your worldly matters, then I'm also a human being. You can accept it or leave it. And there is in, in another hadith of the same, you know, another riwaya of the same hadith, additional words, Antum alamu bi umure dunyakum, you know more than, you, than myself about these worldly affairs of yours. Because I am not an agriculturist. You know the agriculture, agriculture and its rules. In the same way we should infer from this hadith that he didn't come to teach us physics or chemistry or biology or technology. So about these things, you know, you are free. Go ahead. The experimental sciences, the experimental knowledge, you are free. There's no bar. But about halal and haram, what is permissible, what is not permissible, about the metaphysical realities of this universe, these things are to be taken from him, from Wahiya Khafi as well as Wahiya Jali. Now what about after Muhammad Sallallahu We have discussed some of ah, during the lifetime of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about after him? After him there can be two conditions theoretically. Either there is the, the system of Khilafah, Allah min Haji Nubuwa, Caliphate in the footsteps of the Prophethood. Or you may call it in the modern terminology an Islamic State. What is an Islamic State? Where it is expressly written in the Constitution that sovereignty belongs to Allah and no legislation can be done here repugnant to the, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Prophet. Without any exception, all matters will come under the jurisdiction of the book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If this is written, now this becomes an Islamic State. Then you have to have the same relationship of Samurta with the head of the State. With one difference only, let me discuss that one difference only. What's the difference of Samotah with Rasul and the Samotah for anybody else after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What is that difference? The, dif the Samotah, listen and obey, for the Messenger of Allah is absolute. Whatever he commands regarding deen, you have to obey. You have no option. Just as I quoted the ayah, مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُولَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ No option, no choice whatsoever. His word, his verdict, final. But for nobody after him, there is absolute samota. The samota will be limited within the injunctions of the Sharia. You are nobody to declare anything haram or declare anything halal. It was the prerogative of Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That deen has been completed. 
اليوم اقبل تو لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الاسلام دينا now there's nobody who can decide and who could declare something to be haram and something to be halal that thing has been completed within these limits of halal or haram that have been laid down by the book of allah and the sunnah of the prophet yes within the circle within the limits yes we shall listen and okay that is what we call some utafil ma'ruf ma'ruf according to and within the limits of the sharia that is why when there was bara for abu bakr for umar always it was fil maruf abu bakr said after his bayah of khilafa if i go on the right path it's your duty and farz that you obey me and if i go on the wrong path it's your duty and farz to rectify me to correct me because infallibility has come to an end with the end of the institution of prophethood no person after muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is infallible no imam no khalifa if abu bakr was not infallible umar was not infallible usman was not infallible ali was not infallible who else can claim to be infallible there can be errors So actually, now please note the most profound ayah of the Quran on this subject is ayah number fifty-nine of Surah An-Nisa. Ya ayu al-dinah manu wa tiyu Allah wa tiyu Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Fa in tanazatum fi shayin farudhu ila Allah wa Rasul. In kuntum tu minu na billahi wal yom al akhir. Zalika khairun wa ahsanu taamila. O oh, you who profess to believe, obey Allah and obey His Messenger, and your leaders, people at the helm of affairs from amongst you, not the kafirs, not the non-Muslims, ulul amre minkum, people who are at the helm of affairs from amongst you, and if there is any dispute. If a if a person who is the Amir, who is the Khalifa, who is the head of the Islamic State, he says something and you say no, it's wrong. According to Sharia, this should be the opinion. Fine, tana zatum fi am. If there is any difference of opinion regarding any matter, rudu hu ilallahi wa rasool. Then the decision will be taken from Allah and His Messenger. That is, only two arguments are tenable. either from the book of allah or from the practice of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam no third argument because permanent obedience is to allah and the messenger only absolute and permanent obedience for allah and his messenger that is why you know the word atiu has been repeated atiu allah wa atiu rasul but the third time this atiu has not been repeated wa ulil amri minkum because it is conditional the obedience to the ulil amr people at the helm of affairs is conditional it is necessary obedience to them if it is within the sharia the limits of the sharia otherwise not fa in tanazatum fi shay'in farudhu ila allah wa rasul in kuntum tu'minuna billahi wal yawm al akhir zalika khairu wa ahsanu ta'wila now what does this mean please prepare for the shock it is going to be shocking for you it is haram for a muslim to live in a country where the people at the helm of affairs are not muslims who are you obeying you are permitted to obey allah and his messenger wa ulul amri minkum people at the helm of affairs from amongst you then we read in the very first ayah of this surah la ul mulk yusabbihu lillahi ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ard lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd 
sovereignty belongs to him alone. So living in a country where sovereignty belongs to somebody else. Sovereignty belongs to the people, not to Allah. That is why they can decide that two males can marry. Then we recognize as husband and wife. Because it's the majority vote that has to decide. No reference to Allah, no reference to the, the, to the messenger of Allah, no reference to the Sharia. It is haram. So what's the makhraj? What's the way out? What's the exit? There's the exit, you know, written in red words. It's a dilemma. Must be some outlet, some exit. The exit is, if you are living in a society or a state in which sovereignty is not for Allah, in which the law of Sharia is not supreme, you can live there only if you are exerting to your utmost to uproot the system and establish the sovereignty of Allah there. If you are working for that, if you are living for that and you are ready to die for that, then it is halal. Otherwise it is haram. You might not be taking haram meat but every breath that you are taking is haram. You are living in a society and you have taken the citizenship by declaring an on oath that you are faithful to this constitution. And this constitution, and this pertains not only to United States. We in Pakistan are especially fortunate that at least in the constitution it has been written that sovereignty belongs to Allah, although we are not practicing it. But still I can say that I am living in a country in which the constitution is saying that sovereignty belongs to Allah here. It is there written in the objective resolution. And now that objective resolution has become an integral part of the constitution, article 2a of the constitution. It declares sovereignty belongs to Allah. And all authority that we have is delegated authority, not our own. And this authority is to be used within the limits prescribed by the real sovereign, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is there in the constitution. I don't know any other country in the world, not even Saudi Arabia, where the constitution declares the sovereignty belongs to Allah. Anyhow, please understand these things. If you are living in a country or a society or a state where the word of Allah is not supreme, the law of Sharia is not supreme, sovereignty is not accepted for Allah, then you are, so to say, at constant war with that society and you have to struggle continuously to change the system and establish the system of caliphate in the footsteps of the prophethood. And for that, you must have a party. A revolution can be brought about by a party, not a single individual. Now that samota will be for the Amir of that party, which has been founded only with the sole aim of changing the basic system and establishing the deen of Allah. An deen wa la Establish the deen of Allah. You might not be succeed in doing it, but if you have put in what you can, if you have done your job, if you have done your bit, if you have spent for the cause of Allah, whatever you have, well, you will be. You will be successful, declared successful on the day of judgment. So this is the samuta. Samuta number one for Allah. Number two for Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet was living in this world, he was the head of the state, he was the chief justice, he was the commander-in-chief, and he was the messenger of Allah also. After him, 
only two conditions can be there. Either there is an Islamic state, there is a system of caliphate in the footsteps of prophethood, or there is some secular system, popular sovereignty or kingship or something else, some sort. Then there you know, if a moment is living, the only halal way of living is to be in continuous struggle against, the, against that system and endeavoring to the maximum, exerting to the utmost, spending everything that he has to change the system and establish the deen of Allah or according to the biblical words, to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For this purpose you must have a party and now you must have your oath of allegiance of Samota with the head of that party. Now let me give you the final issue of this subject. What is the agreement of Samota? The agreement of Samota is bear and bear. These two words are of Quran. Bear. Shara, shara o bear. Bear, you sell something. Ishtara, you purchase something. Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. And this ayah is a long one. It ends. Fastab shiru be bear e kumul ladi baayatam bi. If you have made this bargain, if you have really sold yourself, your lives and whatever belongs to you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then actually be merry, rejoice that you have made the best bargain. Fastab shiru be bear e kumul ladi baayatam bi. But this bear, you know, which is between a man, a moment, and his Rabb Allah. But the actual agreement of Bayah was done at the hand of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is called Bayah. Oath of allegiance. Oath of Samu'ata'a. We are ready, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We pledge ourselves. We will listen to whatever you say, and we will obey it. Now this is the hadith. Please memorize it. It is muttafaqun alayh. There is no higher level of the authenticity of a hadith than this hadith on which both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim agree that it is authentic hadith. Muttafaqun alayh. No higher level of authenticity. The reporter is Ubadah ibn Samit radiyallahu ta'ala an, an Ansari from Medina. And note the word, Bayana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We pledged ourselves, we gave our bayah to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is that bayah? Ala sam'i wa ta'a. That we shall listen and obey. Fil usri wal yusri. In difficulty as well as ease. Maybe the conditions are difficult, but we shall obey. If the conditions are easy, we shall obey. If the matter is difficult, we shall obey. If the matter is easy, we shall obey. Wal man shate wal makrahe. Whether we feel inclined to do it or we have to force ourselves to do it. Please understand it. There is some commandment coming. You disagree with the commandment. That that is a better strategy. Maybe if at Badr the Prophet ﷺ had persisted or insisted that no, our camp should be here. Keep it here then you know some of the Sahaba could feel within their own hearts that it's a mistake, strategic mistake. Even they have to obey. Manshat, Nishat. Well, you know, 
you are inclined. You are agreeing with it. Wal makrah, karaha. You have to force yourself to do it. Wa ala asratin alayna. And the third thing, although others might be preferred to us, this is the biggest, you know, dispute in some party or organization. Well, I am a senior person, he is just a newcomer, and he has been given the office. How come? No, ala asaratin alayna. It's up to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To whom you like, to whom you, so ever you prefer, feel free. Put him at the helm of affairs. And please note here, you know, even in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he was the commander-in-chief. But in a battle you have, you know, the Masara, the Maimana, the right wing, the left wing. Someone is commanding the right wing of the army. Somebody is commanding the left wing of the army. You know, there were those 50 archers at the Battle of Ohod. They were given the commandment to stay there, whatsoever might happen. Now they had a leader there, they had a commander there. They had to obey him also. There's a very beautiful hadith of the Prophet. Man atani faqad ata Allah, wa man asani faqad asa Allah, wa man ata amiri faqad ata ani, wa man asa amiri faqad asa ani. Whosoever obeys me, he obeys Allah. Whosoever disobeys me, he disobeys Allah. And whosoever obeys the person whom I have put at, as the head of the Amir of a contingent, he is obeying me. And if he is disobeying the Amir appointed by me, he is disobeying me. Simple. Absolutely simple. So then, ala asaratin alayna. Although you might prefer others to us, we are not going to challenge your decision. And we pledge that we shall not quarrel with those whom you place at the helm of affairs. We shall, shall not dispute with them. We shall cooperate with them. We shall obey them also. And there are these additional words, you know, where the pointer is, Illa antara kufran bawahan inda kufihi min Allahi burhan. Except that you see from your Amir something which is kufr, clear kufr. And you have a clear proof with you that it is kufr, it is against Sharia, then you don't obey. But if you don't have any clear proof that it is beyond the pale of Sharia, beyond the limits of Sharia, you have to obey. Although you might be differing from his opinion. Bayana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala sam'i wa ta'ati fil usri wal yusri wal manshati wal makrahi wa ala asaratin alayna wa ala allahu nazil amra ahlahu wa ala an naqula bil haqqi ayna ma kunna la nakhafu fi allahi lawmat al-ayn Last article of this bayah was and we shall say out whatever is true wherever we shall be we shall never hold back our opinion fearing you know some that people will laugh at us or people will, you know, blame us. No. Whatever our opinion, we shall express. This is the total constitution of Hezbollah, the party, which is to strive to establish the deen of Allah, to establish the kingdom of Allah on earth. Now, I was discussing there can be only two conditions. Either there is an Islamic state, then Samota fil maruf, to the head of that state. Fil maruf. This is the bayah to Muhammad. Samuta'a. No maruf. Because he is infallible. He cannot give any order or commandment which is beyond the limits of Sharia. He is himself Sharia. He is Sharia. He has to follow the Sharia. But for nobody else after him there can be absolute obedience. The obedience will be limited. That is why we have adopted this hadith as the basis of joining tanzim islami but we have added the word inni ubayyuka ala sam'i wa ta'ati fil ma'ruf 
The rest of the bayah is the same. Fi al-usri wal yusri wal manshati wal makrahi wa ala asaratin alayya wa ala laun azal amr ahlahu wa ala naqula bil haqqi ayna ma kuntu la akhafu fi Allahi la umata lahi. Now please, one word more, and again prepare for the shock. These concepts of our deen are absolutely not discussed. You might never have heard about these things. This is the hadith included by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. And it is from the son of Umar, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, Abdullah ibn Umar. What are the wordings the Prophet said? Mam mata wa laysa fi unuqihi ba'atun mata meetatan jahiliyatan. Whosoever dies and there is not in his neck, what should I call it, halqa, the bond of ba'a. He dies the death of Jahiliyyah. Jahiliyyah was the term pre-Islamic era. That was the time of Jahiliyyah. Because there can be only two possible conditions. Either there is Islamic state, you must have the bear of the Amirul Mu'mineen, of the Khalifa. If there is none, then you should, be, should belong to a party and you have to have the bayah of the Amir of that party. No third condition possible. So this is a very categor categorical statement, but this is the statement of the Prophet. And this is the hadith from the Sahih of the Imam Muslim. I'm nobody to say it. Mam mata wa laysa fi uluqihi ba'atun mata meetatan jahiliyatan. Now please, another hadith. To conclude this subject of Samata, now this is the hadith from Haris Ash'ari radiyallahu ta'ala an. Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aamurukum bi khamsin. O Muslims, I command you, I give you command, order you for five things. Bil jama'ate wa sami'i. وَالطَّاعَةِ وَالْحِجْرَةِ وَالْجِحَادِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ رواه الإمام أحمد والإمام الترمزي رحمه الله إمام أحمد في مسنده وإمام ترمزي في جامعه Most of the Muslims have never heard this hadith Each one of us knows those five things بني الإسلام على خمس شهادة لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وصوم رمضان وحج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا صحيح حديث صحيح متفق عليه but who said so محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and whose hadith is this some other person or the same Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't know this, we know that. Why? Because those are only modes of worship. That we have been doing under the Britishers also, that we can do here also. That we have been doing everywhere, so it is continuing. We know these five things. Shahadat ya la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاعِ الزَّكَاءِ وَصَوَامِ رَمَضَانِ وَحَدِّ الْبَيْتِ Everybody, every Muslim knows. But this is the hadith to establish the deen. Islam is not a religion in the limited sense of the word, consisting of dogma and, and modes of worship only, and some rites and rituals and social customs only. It's a deen, the whole political socio-economic system, system of life, way of life. And it needs and demands its establishment as a whole political social economic system. For that you have to have a jama'ah. That jama'ah should be disciplined jama'ah. Samota. And then jama'ah, what, what shall jama'ah do? Al-hijrah wal jihad fi sabirillah. Because this concept has faded away from our thinking. 
Hence, this has become irrelevant. When there is no concept of the establishment of Deen of Allah, this is irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. And you know, out of sight, out of mind. When it has lost the relevance, it is outside our minds. But please remember, Samwata, that is the central point. Jama'ah, because only a party, only a Jama'ah, only a Hizb, that can strive to establish the deed of Allah. No individual can do it. Individual can propagate. Indiv individual can go on preaching. Individual can do teaching, teaching, preaching, propagation. All this can be done by individual. But to establish the being as a living, actual reality of political, social, economic system, you need a revolution, a change of the system. For that you need a party, for that you need jihad, for that you need hijra. And this hijra and jihad will be done through, we shall be discussing this hijra and jihad in very detail, you know, in the fourth section of this, this uh, selected course of study. But here I only wanted because this is the discussion of Fattakullaha Mastatatum Vasmau Watiu. Now the fourth thing in this ayah, Wanfiku Mim Wanfiku Khairalli Anfusikum. At least this ayah should be completed today. What is infaq? This is also, you know, very basic term of his Quran. We think infaq means only spending money, no. The Arabs say, Nafaq al-Faras, the horse is dead. Nafaqat is darahim, money is finished. No more dollars. My pocket is empty. Nafaqat is darahim. All dirham of dinar have been spent. Nafaq al-Faras, the horse is dead. Infaq, spend. Now this infaq, is actually equal to jihad. Quran either says, Jahidu fi sabirillahi bi amwalikum wa anfusikum. Make jihad for the cause of Allah and spend your lives as well as your money and belongings. You have to spend your bodily resources and the worldly resources that you have. Worldly belongings and bodily resources. And you know, in, these, in these, this time, everybody knows, time is money. And I quoted the hadith, Kullu nafsin yagdu fa bayaun nafsahu. One hour of a doctor is equal to so many dollars. One hour of an unskilled laborer is equal to eight dollars, for example. Of a skilled laborer is equal to fifteen dollars, or maybe twenty dollars. So actually time is money. And what is adding, you know, is, is your expertise, your knowledge. So everything you call, tell me are in, in terms of money. And they are exchangeable. You can hire any person. You give him the money and you have, you know, his expertise is available to you. You can use it. His physical power is available to you. You can use it. So actually, in fact, covers the whole thing. Spend your bodily resources as well as your worldly belongings. What for? That has not been expressed here fully. But the word Al-Malik in the very first ayah, it clinches the matter to establish the kingdom of Allah on earth. فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَاسْمَعُوا وَأَطِيعُوا وَأَنْفِقُوا خَيْرًا لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ It's good for you, for your own self. You'll get the reward on the day of judgment. وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And whosoever is saved from the greed of his baser self, his id or libido, only he will be able to be declared successful on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include us all among those. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Aqoolu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisair al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimat.